Now we have another distinguished speaker, Professor Tanusri Saha Taskupta. As I was mentioning in the morning, the materials that we use define our life. Uh, today she is going to talk about using computations to design materials, how to how these materials can be designed using a lot of approaches, mathematical approaches. And she is very well known and she is a fellow of all the three major academies of India, National Academy of in, Indian Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences India, and the Academy of Sciences uh, Bangalore. In addition to that, she is also a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, and she is a J.C. Bose National Fellow. And she has won several awards. Uh, the list is wrong, let's not go into that uh, awards list, but main work is that how we can use mathematical and computational and physics knowledge to create new materials. May I request Dr. Tanusri Saha to please come on to the dais and present the talk. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Let me start by thanking the organizer for having me here. I'm feeling very proud and honored to be in the middle of such distinguished uh, people uh, and distinguished women <laughs> and I'm proud to be a part of it and uh, as uh, already announced by uh, Professor Rao that I'm going to talk about materials and uh, a change of gear from engineering to science and more towards basic science and materials by computation I'm going to show the challenges and opportunities and I come from SNBOS National Center for Basic Sciences, which was established in the year 1986 by Department of Science and Technology to honor the uh, life and work of Professor Shatendranath Bose. Well, Pro Professor Shatendranath Bose, this man who is known as the father of the quantum physics, the father of the God particle, he himself didn't win the Nobel Prize, but after his finding, so many Nobel Prizes are given, so you might actually think who cares about getting a Nobel Prize, you know. Every Nobel Prize citation actually has, in the topic of quantum physics, has mention of him. So, you know, nothing more you really can ask for. And in SNBO Center, we have actually made an archive and museum on him. And uh, I really invite all of you to come to SNBO Center and have a look at our archive. We are also going to make a virtual tour of the archive, so those who cannot travel can also have a look at this archive. Okay, so this slide, after the you know introduction by Professor Rao, I thought you know it's redundant, but nevertheless, let me tell it again that the importance of materials in human civilization is so much so that different ages of human civilization has been named after one material or another, starting from the very stone age to the modern age where we live is the age of silicon. And it was the first sightness of the Italian painter, philosopher, as well as a scientist, Leonardo da Vinci, who said that when nature finishes to produce its own species, man begins using natural things in harmony with this very nature to create an infinity of species. And that is what, as mentioned by Professor Rao again, is the design materials age to create new materials as per your requirement. And the special category of materials which are belong to this design materials are known as quantum materials. So what are quantum materials? They basically exhibit properties which are dominated by the rules of quantum mechanics, which was the foundation of which was laid by the great man of our country like Shatendranath Bose. The example of such 
materials are materials exhibiting properties like superconductivity, magnetism. There are many recent development like multiferroics, topological insulators and the underlying thing is the properties are dominated by quantum fluctuation, quantum entanglement, quantum coherence, all of them being manifestation of quantum mechanical effect. And it's a worldwide effect to kind of answer this question, how could quantum technology transform our societies? And CIFA, which is a major funding agency of Canada, as you can see, they have basically collected scientists from all across the globe to answer this very question. Another example, there are several examples of this worldwide effect and where basically people are joining hands together from different countries to come up with this idea of quantum science and technology. And India is not lagging behind, India bets big on quantum technology. This is from the budget speech of our finance minister where India's largest budget receiving 80 billion rupees over five years as a part of new national quantum mission has been announced. Quantum computing, I think almost everyone in this room has heard about the word quantum computing. That's a type of computation that harnesses the collective properties of this quantum state that I have just mentioned, like superposition, interference, because the normal computers, they are all working under the principle of bit manipulation, where the bit can be either one or zero. That's a binary thing. But in quantum mechanics, out of these two state, one and zero, you can, by superposition, create an infinity number of other states. So think of a computer built on that kind of algorithm that will be way faster and that will be a sea change, a revolution. Now different kind of platforms has been discussed in building such kind of quantum computer or quantum technology like supercomputing loops, trapped ions, silicon quantum dots, topological qubits, diamond vacancies and it's really a frontier research to come up with which of this platform is most suited for making a quantum computer. But behind all of these and as already mentioned even to make a aircraft engineering the role of materials is enormous because information is physically encoded in materials. So unless and understand you understand the materials making anything out of it is difficult. So understanding and prediction on quantum materials, that's not job of one person, that's a teamwork. It needs basically the hand holding of the scientists doing experiment, theory, as well as simulation, the scientists like me. It's a teamwork involving synthesis, characterization, design, fabrication, prototype, and modeling the part where I come in. So what I'm going to do is tell you how this theory supported computation can be used in understanding as well as making prediction of such quantum materials. So the, you know, our bread and butter is high performance computing and uh, this list is pretty old list and not at all uh, updated list. This just lists some of the places where some of the high performance computers are. But the most uh, recent news is that India has come up with national supercomputing mission and we are right now in the third phase of this national supercomputing mission where the job is to install petaflop machines across various corners of India. And in this third phase, nine more places have been identified to install the supercomputers and among these nine places we are very happy to find that Tessenbo Center also figures and the job has started and it's basically the CDAC who is doing the implementation so very soon we are going to have a petaflop uh, machine also at Tessenbo Center but it's supposed to cater all the institutes in the eastern region of the India. 
Well, so with that, back to science. So I am going to tell you basically the three categories of the problems that you can address with such kind of computational tool. The first category of the problem is not designing. The first step is understanding. Understanding materials property, namely the structure property relationship. And the example that I will show is the example that I take from superconductivity. So what is superconducting state? It's the state of the matter in which even at a finite temperature, non-zero temperature, that means zero Kelvin is the absolute zero, above that temperature, the material loses its resistivity, becomes a perfect conductor and the electricity flows without any resistance. And it was discovery in elemental mercury. And since its discovery, the effort has been gone in increasing this superconducting transition temperature as higher as possible, ideally to make it room temperature. So this plot basically shows in the x-axis the year. As the year goes, how this superconducting transition temperature of different material has grown. And till date, the material, the champion material at ambient condition without applying any pressure or anything are the cuprates. They are all copper oxygen based. And here I show basically the list of, that's a family of compounds. All of them has copper and oxygen in common. And these are basically materials or compounds where you have sheet of copper and oxygen and in between this sheet you have different elements like lanthanum, barium, thallium, mercury, etc. And they basically all of them has a common phase diagram where by doping this material a superconducting dome shows up with the maximum Tc of this dome is what is known as the superconducting transition temperature at optimal doping. But what is interesting that if you have lanthanum in this material, this maximum Tc is 40 Kelvin, while going to a material which has mercury and barium, this Tc shoots up to 90 Kelvin, which is more than a factor of 2. So it's very interesting to understand where does this material dependence come from? Just by changing lanthanum to mercury and barium, how, why the Tc becomes, jumps up with a factor of 2. And as I already mentioned, so these compounds have this copper oxygen plane which is shown with like with a pink shading. And you have most interestingly, you have another oxygen which is out of plane from this pink shaded plane and that's called the epical oxygen. And what we found our computation basically filtered out one key quantity, one key structural quantity that is this distance of this epical oxygen from copper to copper oxygen plane. And we found that this distance is the key parameter that covers, that basically governs the extent of this wave function that dictates the superconducting state. And what is shown here, we basically plotted the range of this uh, wave function across the all known materials in this family, which were so many materials. And we found a really nice correlation. So that means the understanding that we provided, if you can make this distance higher and higher, the superconducting transition temperature will grow more and more and more. But of course, the nature is not always so kind. If you can make it higher and higher and higher, after a certain point, phase coherence breaks and the material breaks and the material is not formed. But nevertheless, you can reach up to a temperature which is more than 100 Kelvin, which is still the kind of a record temperature that you have so far. Well, in the previous example, the material was known, the superconducting property was known, our computation made a connection between the two. Now in the next stage, we have some known material. Can the computation predict some new properties which has not been looked upon, but the materials are known. And what I am going to talk about here 
are what is known as hybrid materials. So what are hybrid materials? Materials which has organic as well as inorganic component. So here the inorganic component is a transition metal which are connected by some organic molecule. And since it is organic molecule, they are very flappy and they can be changed by some external perturbation like temperature. And by this external perturbation, which can be temperature or pressure, the pressure can be chemical pressure, mechanical pressure, magnetic field, substrate effect, even light irradiation, the same material can actually be in two different magnetic state. One magnetic state being a diamagnetic state or a non-magnetic state and the other state being a magnetic state. So that means the same material by an external perturbation can be either in a magnetic state or in a non-magnetic state. And this is known basically in the field as molecular bistability. The same molecule can be at two different states depending on the external condition. Now this whole thing can be made cooperative. If I put one molecule next to each other and make like a polymer, if we can do that, then this transition becomes cooperative and can show up with the hysteresis. So what is this hysteresis in this case? I take this material, I heat it up and at a particular temperature the transition which is known as a spin state transition happens from non-magnetic to a magnetic state. But if I cool this material, the transition happens from magnetic to non-magnetic state at a different temperature and shows up with the hysteresis. So the moment it shows up with hysteresis, the material actually has a memory. The material can remember whether I was in a cooling path or in a heating path. That is exactly shown in, this is some experimental observation, the same material at the same temperature, but whether I am at the heating path or cooling path shows two different color because the color associated with when the material is magnetic is of one kind and when it is non-magnetic is of the other kind. So therefore, you can use it like a switch and since it can happen also with shining light, you can use it as an optical switch. By shining light, the material can change its color and the material can remember which path I took to make this change. So this is extremely important and what our calculative uh, you know, research showed is that given such kind of polymers, many of them has been synthesized but has not really understood or really probed for such kind of properties. Such kind of properties can be induced and they will be extremely used, useful to be used as a memory device. So that, in that case, these polymers are known. The chemists have already made it. They did not really explore such kind of the spin crossover properties with cooperative effect. But the last one is even more challenging. Can we predict, that was Leonardo da Vinci's idea, can we predict new material altogether? I want some material with some targeted property. Can we predict this material which does not exist so far in literature? And the example I will show is that of a magnetic material. Well, magnetic material has enormous technological importance starting from electromagnets, electric motors to generators to magnetic storage like tape recorders, hard disk, I don't think I have to emphasize it more on it. Every day all of us are using one kind of magnet or other kind of magnet. But you will be very surprised to know magnets are in reality they are very rare. Only 5% of known inorganic compounds are magnetic. So we therefore need new magnetic materials. So, mag and also among the magnets, there are magnetic materials which demand special importance. Like ferromagnetic half metals, perhaps you have not heard about this term. 
We all know a ferromagnet iron is a ferromagnet, but half metals are the materials for which only the electrons with a specific spin polarization they can conduct, the other opposite spin polarization it's insulating. So that means iron is a ferromagnet but not a half metal. That means it's a metal but it's metal where the electrons with both up spin and down spin they can conduct. Up spin conducts more than the down spin but they both conduct. We want a material only up spin will conduct and down spin will not conduct. What is the advantage of it? Of course you use electrons to carry information from one side to another side. But if in addition and there you use the charge property of the electron. But in addition to that if we can use also the spin of the electron I have another mechanism to carry information. And that has given rise to this entire field of spintronics, the spin valve effect, which are central to magnetic storage and sensing. And to make these materials or these devices, what you need in addition to ferromagnetic half metal, anti-ferromagnetic metal. What is ferromagnet? Where the spins at different sides are all aligned in the same direction. In case of anti-ferromagnet, they are aligned in the opposite direction as is shown here. As I said, nature is not always very generous to us. The ferromagnets, we want to make such kind of the spin valve and spintronics device. We need ferromagnetic half metal, we need anti-ferromagnetic metal. But the most material we know around us, even if they are ferromagnets like iron, Though metals, they are not a half metals and most antiferromagnets we know of like nickel oxide or other kinds of oxides, they are insulators but they are not metals. So I am actually asking or demanding for something which is not there in the nature. I want some antiferromagnet to be metal where in nature they are insulator. I want some ferromagnet to be half metal while in nature they are not half metal but they are metals. So we therefore need new materials with targeted property. By targeted property here I mean there is an anti ferromagnet with a metallic property and a ferromagnet with a half metallic property. Well we take the example of when you search for something here to search you cannot search everywhere here to focus where I am going to search. And we search in a family of compound which are known as double perovskite and maybe some people here know of the word perovskite. These are specific kind of crystal structure which is known as perovskite and they are all oxide based and the formula is ABO3 where A is like uh, uh, alkaline or alkali metal or uh, rare earth and B is normally a transition metal. You double this formula then it becomes A2B2O6 and since you have B2 instead of one metal you can actually put two metal which are known as B which I am labeling as B and B. You can order this B and B prime in a rock salt manner as it's shown here and many of the solid state chemists have been able to do that. And I show here already some known double proskite which are magnetic and shows pretty high transition temperature. This is a very nice uh, review article. What they did at the A side they fixed at divalent cation like calcium, strontium, barium or trivalent cation like lanthanum. Then they ran across the entire periodic table putting along B, B prime combination. So each box is actually a BB prime combination. The boxes shaded with green are the materials that have been already made, synthesized. The yellow ones, the materials made but need uh, extreme condition meaning high pressure or high temperature to synthesize them. The violet ones, the materials were made but they were not in perovskite crystal structure, some other crystal structure. Red ones are the attempts made but failed, the compounds did not form. What is interesting, there are so many white boxes, 
That means so many combination BP prime which people have not tried to make. And that's understandable, you know, making a material cost energy, cost consumable, cost human effort, and it's a lot of trial and error. So people have not done that. But that's a good thing, good news for people like us, the computational people. We can play around a lot with all these possibilities and can predict not only whether they can be formed or what kind of properties they will have. And can one use machine learning? Well, that's the buzzword of today's world, but I think that has a great potential because the whole question that was asked, can artificial intelligence create the next wonder of material? And many researchers, including me, believe that machine learning technique can revolutionize how the material science is done. And we basically applied this method, which is nothing but a pattern recognition. It's recognizing pattern, the pattern which human brain cannot recognize, the, but the machine can recognize. So these are the basic step. You make a database. So in our case, the database was already known, double perovskite compound, and you have to have some attribute. That means to signify each and every data. For example, if I want to have a bunch of people here and try to find out who are from which state of India. You know? So I take each of this person, I think of some attribute like their food habit, their dress, their language, these are all attribute to characterize that data. That's called a data set. And once you prepare a data set, you also have to do some post-processing of the data, pre-processing of the data in terms of elimination of outlier, finding out certain correlation of the attribute and removing them. And once you do that, you come up with a machine learning model. Machine understands the pattern given to it. It learns it. And then you predict, apply this learning in predicting a new compound. In our case, we will give a person who has not been identified from which state of India that person comes from and the machine makes a prediction which state of India it comes from. That's the whole idea. And we did that. We basically made our learning set out of some 641 compounds that are known in the literature. And we made the prediction on 412 new BB prime combination. If you remember, we started with this BB prime combination. At the A site, we put these divalent cations, fixed them, and basically varied over this BB prime combination. In addition to known compounds, which are marked with these yellow boxes, we predicted some 33 new compounds, which with a very strong confidence level, we said that if these compounds are made, they will be made as a double perovskite. 60 compounds with moderate level of confidence for 29, we could not resolve our prediction because it was a 50-50 chance. 54 compounds, they were classified as non-double perovskite even if you attempt them to make, either they will not form or form in a non-double perovskite crystal structure. Not only that, once we make such kind of the screening and come up with the prediction of this 33, you have to characterize their crystal structure, electronic and magnetic property. And that is what we did, fixing again this calcium-based, strontium-based, and barium-based. And these are the different BB prime combination. And I have colored them. So the magenta colored are ferrimagnetic insulator. They are more like antiferromagnet, but where the size of the spins are two neighboring sites are different. And ferromagnetic metal, which is, of course, a known uh, system. Then some turned out to be non-magnetic. Some antiferromagnetic insulator, also uh, you have examples of such in nature. But we succeeded in make, getting, discovering many new ferromagnetic half metals 
that are not really known in nature and that what we were looking for and one example of antiferromagnetic metal that we were really looking for. So, these actually gave us a machine learning assisted prediction of new materials. So, I will just end with this statement that materials matters and new materials in design is one of the key idea of modern day material science research. Quantum materials is a playground for future and uh, I, my talk was based on a review article that I wrote. So, if anyone is interested can have a look at this review article and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for making that very difficult topic so simple and uh, people could at least appreciate what is the attempt that you, that you are putting up and instead of just binary that we use zeros and ones and how other devices can be utilized for memory and things like that. If, uh, if anyone has any question or a comment, uh, you are welcome to make so. Yeah, please. For any machine learning assisted uh, material design, uh, the success of that algorithm or any model depends on the size and the quality of the data. Absolutely. So, for your double perovskite structures, so I can see it is only the 621 uh, data size, right? So, can you comment on that uh, experimental data you do have? and also the, uh, the nature of the data. Absolutely, very good question and very pertinent question. So, in machine learning, I think two major problems are, as you rightly said, is the size of the data set and the quality of the data in the sense that people don't actually uh, report the negative data. But for machine learning, negative data is as important as positive data. For example, if you see the number of red colored boxes were much less than the green colored boxes simply because the attempts which failed people don't report. You can't write a paper based on a failed thing, but for us it's very, very important. And one of the challenge applying machine learning in material science is the size of the data. So, we did two uh, techniques. First of all, we used which is known as cost sensitive algorithm. That means the cost, the weight associated with a positive thing is much more than a negative because the size of the negative set is much less that compared to the positive set. And we also generated some of the synthetic data. There are detailed algorithms for that. And by that, making the synthetic data, we pushed the number of data sites to beyond 1,000. And we applied, of course, when you do the cross-validation, you apply your data set into different modules and cross-validation is like 10-fold, 20-fold. You can check the goodness of your method by doing that. Any, any other? If there are none? Thank you very much for a very lucid talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Now we are breaking for lunch. Lunch has been arranged in uh, DJ Park, that is uh, Diamond Jubilee Park. So, State Road from here to there and uh, we will uh, come back by 2 p.m.